Gracious and loving God, may only your words be spoken. May only your words be heard. Amen. Please be seated. It is that season of the church year where the preacher comes out from behind the pulpit. Be warned, I am among you. I want to begin my reflection this morning uh, talking a little bit about my dad. Um, and it is not, as you know, my practice to preach on uh, holidays brought to us by Hallmark. Um, but it is an interesting combination of observances today uh, that leads my heart to hear what it is hearing uh, in the Gospel. And what I thought about when thinking about the Gospel this morning and thinking about my dad was how hard it was to pick out a card for my father on Father's Day. My dad was a career correctional officer. He worked as a correctional officer for 35 years uh, in the prisons in Rhode Island. And uh, those of you who met him know that if I gave you your, the rest of your life uh, to have guessed what he did for a living, if you didn't know, uh, it would have been the very last thing you would have ever uh, guessed. My dad was uh, gentle and kind and fair uh, and loving. And in our house, my dad was the homemaker as well. My, it was my dad who often would cook dinner uh, each night for the family. It was my dad who cleaned and kept the house and did laundry, which when you had a teenager in the 80s, was no small task, because uh, we wore lots of clothes all the time, all at once. Uh, so my dad was this incredible uh, image and picture of strength um, and perseverance and honor and justice, but also of uh, sensitivity and caring and nurturing. And I remember when I would go up to the uh, Brooks at the top of the street to get my daddy's card, there was never a card for my dad because uh, my dad didn't play golf. Uh, the favorite thing in the world for him to do was not to tinker around in the garage with his tool set. Uh, it was to uh, stand over the stove making uh, shanice and peppers or, or liver and onions. Uh, so often I would be left sort of unsure of what card and usually land on that generic thanks for being a dad card, right? Um, and so, but I, I know it's also a journey that my dad wrestled with a little bit. My dad was, uh, lost his mom when he was very young and his dad uh, left the family also when he was very young. So my dad was raised by his grandmother um, and by his aunts and lots of very strong Portuguese women uh, in his life. And then when he got older, he was actually raised by my mom's mom um, uh, as they met very young. So he was raised by very, very strong uh, powerful women, and if you met my mom, you'd know that he married one as well. Uh, also equally difficult to buy a Mother's Day card for. Uh, so I know in my conversations with my dad, it was always a question my dad had, whether he was a strong enough father, uh, particularly for his sons, if he led with the kind of uh, cultural male strength that he thought he should um, exhibit, and he always wondered if being raised by all of these women in his life, if it somehow uh, meant that he was less of a man, uh, particularly for his children, uh, than he thought he ought to be. What I hope he knew before he died was what freedom he gave to his sons to be dads that God made us to be rather than Dad's hallmark was trying to tell us we should be. Um, those of you who know me know that I also don't play golf, uh, and I'm also not excited to go hang out and play with tools in the garage if I can avoid it. Um, but it ended up being a huge gift that my dad uh, gave to us and to my brothers to free us 
to be the dads that God was needing us to be rather than the dads the world around us uh, would tell us that we ought to be. It was my dad's freedom in the way that he parented that even made me think uh, that parenthood and fatherhood would be a possibility for me uh, in my life. And so I, I wish that my dad had known that freedom. I wish that my dad had heard earlier on in his life that he was free to be only who it was God made him to be, a beloved, precious, beautiful child of God, and that those gifts, simply being who it was God made him to be, would make him the parent his children needed him to be. I hope in his later years before he died, he was able to hear some of that from me and my siblings. But it was a freedom, if he ever knew it, it was a freedom too long deferred for him. And I think about the time between his being born into the world of beloved child of God and hearing the message of his belovedness and wishing that there wasn't quite so much time in between those two events. Which leads us to the second thing that we are observing and, and celebrating today, which is that of Juneteenth. And for those of you who don't know, Juneteenth marks the day when the word of the Emancipation Proclamation finally made it to Galveston, Texas, the farthest reaches of where the word of emancipation had not yet reached. And we celebrate this day today when that word of emancipation and the word and enactment of true freedom was made known throughout the country as it was at that time. But I can't help but think about the time between when the Emancipation Proclamation was first declared in January and June 19th. And how long it took those people to hear the words of emancipation that had been offered to them. And how they had to live even that much longer, far longer than they ever should have, before they heard that word. And what a gospel message that is for us. That time between God's promise of our own freedom and when that word of freedom finally reaches our ears. There's a message for, there, for us in there about hearing that message, and there is a word for us in proclaiming that message uh, for others. Which leads us to the Gospel readings. You knew I was going to get there eventually. Why are we so afraid of freedom? And why does God's liberation terrify us so much that sometimes when we get a glimpse of that freedom, we don't recognize it as God's liberation, and we end up worshiping the tools we have put in place to prevent that liberation from being known, under the guise of, it's the way we've always done things, or that's just the way it is, or if it was good enough for me, it's good enough for you. Why does it take us so long to let people know that liberating message? And I want to start with the reading from Galatians, because what that reading from Galatians is for us is that that's the starting place. That is true for us as beloved children of God. Right there in that letter to the church of Galatia, there is an argument that all of those divisions, all of those categories that we had spent millennia establishing, no longer matter. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer male or female. There is no longer slave or free because we are all one in Christ Jesus. That letter was written 2,000 years ago. And there are still places in this world who have yet to hear that message of God's liberating love. Now, of course, Paul got that message from Jesus, and Jesus got that message from his parents, faithful Jews. This message of God's liberating love for us is as old as creation itself. It is the first breath of God in this world that speaks liberation, that speaks 
freedom. And yet somehow we continue to falter and stumble and set up categories and rules and blockades from people experiencing that full liberation for themselves. The scene is garrison. Jesus has hopped in a boat across from Galilee, gone over to the other side, which in that, you know, there be dragons, right? This is a far way away. And there's this man who's lived his life in a cemetery because of demons. And Jesus speaks words of liberation. And they are terrified. What do you have to do with us, Jesus? Right? All through this gospel healing story of liberation and freedom is the reaction of fear and trembling and unknowing. Jesus speaks words of liberation. There is fear. Jesus casts the demons out of the man into the swine. And what happens next? The swine herds are not happy, right? The swine herds are like, um, excuse me, uh, livelihood just off the cliff because of this man's healing, right? And then when the neighbors hear that this man has been healed, they are terrified of his healing. There is no much rejoicing for this man who has been freed of his demons. The town does not come and bring food and fabric and rejoicing and music. They do not celebrate with him. They are terrified because he has been made whole. And I think that this is a gospel story for our time. Because lest we think that this story has to do only with other parts of our world, Lest we think that only places like Texas, whether Galveston or otherwise, or places like Florida, need to hear this message. As a mentor of mine once told me, don't preach a sermon to people who are not in the room. This message is for us, my friends. Right? This message is for us to ask ourselves, whose healing terrifies us? Whose restoration to wholeness makes us afraid? When we hear a word of liberation spoken, is our reaction celebration and rejoicing, or is it, I don't understand? What does that mean? Why do they need to push it that far? We often react to liberation with fear. We often react to God's freedom with enacting laws that restrict or, or confine that liberation. We so much want to be the arbitrators of God's redeeming love and redemption. And what the Gospel and the Galatian, reading from Galatians this morning reminds us is that that truth was spoken long ago. Before any of us walked this planet, the truth of God's redeeming love for each and every one of God's children was spoken into the world. How long is it going to take for that message to get to the Galvestons of our hearts? How long is it going to take for us to fully embrace that only when all of God's children are living fully as it is God made them to be, will we be fully living as it is God made us to be? How long will it take us before we join the effort to bring that word of liberation where it has not yet been heard, and to be that word of liberation where it needs to be heard right here at home? Amen. Amen.